All right, good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody in this morning. Go ahead and make your way in from the hallways. Uh, if, as much as you guys can, if you could skew towards the middle and towards the front to allow space for our guests, that would be great. Also a reminder that there is the overflow room that you and especially your small groups uh, should be a part of just to give space for our guests so that they can come in and easily find a spot. I'd like to welcome everyone who's here this morning. I'm excited to be able to worship God together with you. And so as we get ready to worship God, as we prepare our hearts, I'd like us to consider the words of Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Let's go ahead and stand this morning as we worship.
And Lord, we stand amazed at the great grace that we experience because of what you have done in sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and the victory that we have because your son rose from the grave. And we're so thankful for that. All the benefits that come from you. We're so thankful for that. Pray, Lord, that as we enter into this time of worship that we would really consider the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Lord, help us to be overwhelmed with that. Lord, help our hearts desire to respond in obedience to you. I pray, Lord, that you guide our thoughts, put all distractions aside, and help us really to concentrate and understand all that you've done for us in dying on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you haven't picked up your elements, you might want to go back. They are they are available on the back tables and in the uh, commons there's a back table that you can pick up your elements you go ahead and open your elements up as we get settled <clears throat> as we enter this time today to remember the great sacrifice of Christ on behalf of our sins I want to invite everyone who has a personal relationship with Christ to participate with us if you're here with us this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd ask that you would refrain from participating, but just consider the picture that is presented here during this time of communion. If you're under church discipline, I would ask that you not participate, but instead, think about the great sacrifice that was made for your sins and respond in obedience to God's truth. Psalm 139 Verses 23 and 24 tells us, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I want to pause for a moment as an instrument plays and allow God to examine our hearts, expose any sin that might prevent us from approaching this time with a cleansed heart. Let's take a moment and allow God to, to search our hearts. The cross of Christ changed his enemies into his friends. That thought to sink in. Can you imagine the head of Russia becoming a friend of the head of Ukraine? How shocking that'd be. But more shocking is that a holy God turned his enemy into his friend by sending his son to die on the cross and take the punishment that we deserve for our sins on himself, restore a relationship, making us, the sinner, his friends. That's shocking. 
Romans 5, verses 10 and 11 say, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Those of us who know Christ as our Lord and Savior have been restored in our relationship with him. Once we were his enemies, following the passions of our sinful hearts, but Christ's sacrifice has brought peace with God to those who have been covered by his blood. We are now his friends. Isn't that amazing? We were once enemies, now we are his friends. John chapter 15, verses 14 and 15 tells us this. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. When we entered a relationship with Christ through faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, we became attached to him. This particular chapter of the Bible in John 15 is the true vine chapter. We were connected to Christ at salvation. And when that connection, attachment, occurred, we became God's friend. Can you imagine? There's no greater separation that exists than that which is between the sinful and the holy. Jesus' sacrifice obliterated that separation. And we are now brought near to God. And we are considered his friend. And he is our friend. How amazing that grace is. I'm going to ask Bo Lynch to thank God for Christ's body that was broken for us so that we could be reconciled to him. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful, Lord, that you call us friends. Lord, that you've provided a way through your sacrifice. Lord, that a people of lawlessness could seek you as a perfect example. Lord, of what it's like to serve and to love others. Lord, we pray that we would continue uh, to seek that example as we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat together. I'm going to ask Scott Jensen. If you would thank God for the sacrifice of his shed blood that was spilled for our sins. Let's pray. Our Father, this morning we, we thank you so much for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you sent. We thank you that he shed his blood for us because your word tells us that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. And we thank you that he accomplished that to provide and to secure for us eternal redemption father we thank you for the salvation that we have in him and this opportunity to remember the price of our savior's blood spilled for us and we take this element now in remembrance of him and that blood that was shed on our behalf in jesus name amen let's drink together I'm going to invite you to stand as we continue in worship this morning.
pray together. God, thank you so much for the amazing love, the grace that we cannot comprehend that would extend to us. Lord, work within our hearts. Give us a true desire to know you more than anything else. As we approach your word today, God, please work in us to make us open to simply say yes to you and no to our own selfish wants. In Jesus' strong name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I was shocked uh, a minute ago to see my college basketball coach sitting here this morning. <laughs> Pete, good to see you. Don't, uh, don't ask him if, if I was any good. He'll just say, well, he shot a lot of threes, uh, without any regard for anything else or anyone else. <laughs> and that, that pretty much sums up my game. If I pastored like I played basketball, I probably would be looking for a job. <laughs> so uh, it's great to see you, though, Coach. Well, we're back in Matthew chapter 3 this morning. We're continuing our sermon series. Matthew chapter 3. I have a funny question for you. Have you ever named a dog? Steve Johnson has named a dog. Um, have you ever named a dog? It's a, I know it's a weird way to start a sermon. 
Uh, we've, we've had a couple of dogs. Um, we had a few dogs when I was a kid. They were German short hair pointers, uh, big, beautiful dogs. We used them for hunting pheasant in the summers, love pheasant hunting. But if you've ever hunted pheasant with a dog, some of you have, then you know the importance of the dog doing its job. The way pheasant hunting works is that you get several people in a straight line and you walk through a field of very tall grass or you walk a a tree line with brush. And the dog works its way back and forth between the hunters. That's because the pheasant do two things primarily. Uh, They run on the ground instead of flying or they sit tight to see if you'll walk past them and miss them in the brush. So the dog's job is to make the pheasant continue to move ahead to the end of that field or that tree line. And if the pheasant stays put, they point and you can walk in and flush up the bird. But if you reach the end of the field, if the dogs have done their job, there's no more room for the pheasants to run. And that's when they fly and then you can shoot. This whole process is completely lost when the dog decides that it just wants to run. We had one dog that would sometimes bolt just as fast as he could all the way up a tree line or through a field, and you would see pheasants about 400 yards away, way in the distance, flushing up, and just would ruin the hunt. His name was Crockett. And every time Crockett ran off, we would yell at the top of our lungs, Crockett! And then... He would turn his head back slightly and, and then keep running as fast as he could. And so then, you know, your voice would get a little bit angrier. Crockett! Sometimes a farmer would find him and, and see us walking through the field um, looking like idiots. So my dad, this is where it gets good. My dad had a great idea. He, sa- he <laughs> said that he would like to name our next dog Repent. <laughs> So that way, when a farmer would find us in those situations, it would be guys walking through a field with shotguns, yelling, repent! (laughs) So we had a a good laugh. But in our our passage today, we're going to see someone who looks like a crazy man out in the wilderness with one message, repent. In Matthew chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1 this morning. And we're moving on from chapter 2, and there's really a a 30-year break between chapters 2 and 3. So we're we're skipping to Jesus' adulthood. And it's here that Matthew transitions to another very important part of the story, the one whom God would use to set the stage for Jesus' ministry. You can stay in your seats. Uh, We'll begin in verse 1 of chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
God, help us as we dig into this text to see what you would desire us to see, what you're communicating here. In Jesus' name, amen. This section of 12 verses contains so much scriptural content. What we're going to do this morning is to break down the passage into two parts. All right, so let's look at the first portion of our text that covers verses 1 through 6. The messenger preparing the way for the Messiah. The messenger preparing the way for the Messiah. These six verses give us a brief description of John the Baptist, why he is called the Baptist, and what aspect of his message was significant in relation to Jesus' coming ministry. So as we work through the first six verses, we can observe four ways that John the Baptist is described in Matthew's writing. First, we see that he is a preaching messenger. A preaching messenger. It says in verses 1 and 2, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There are a few key details that help us understand John in his context. Notice how verse 1 begins, in those days. In those days. Well, what days? What days is, is Matthew talking about? Well, we can see exactly what days he's referring to by examining Luke's account of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3. It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iterea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, not Kansas, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So how does that help us understand the story? Well, here's a, a few details. I want to explain this without taking too much time. But I believe that it's important. First, Luke describes those days as the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius was the second official Roman emperor. The first was Caesar Augustus, which Luke 2 verse 1 records as the emperor who decreed a census to be taken. Remember? Remember? Uh, that's when Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. The successor of Julius Caesar, or sorry, excuse me, Caesar Augustus, was Tiberius Caesar. His reign began in A.D. 14. So when we see Luke stating that John the Baptist's ministry began in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, we can understand that this is around the year A.D. 29. Second, Luke mentions that Pontius Pilate is the governor of Judea. Another significant fact, because Pilate comes on the scene just a few years later in Jesus' arrest and his sentence to death. Luke mentions other details like Herod the Tetrarch, not the same Herod who commanded the killing of baby boys in Matthew 2. This Herod is the Herod that we are going to see later on in Matthew's gospel account. He's the Herod responsible for John the Baptist's death. And Jesus himself appears before this Herod later on in his exchange with Pilate. Third, Luke mentions the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Caiaphas is significant as the high priest at the time of Jesus' illegal trial and crucifixion. We'll see him later in Matthew 26. So back in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, when Matthew states, in those days, we can better understand the days that he's referring to. They're the days of Tiberius Caesar, the days of Pontius Pilate, the days of Herod the Tetrarch, the days of the high priest Caiaphas. Each one of these historical figures plays a significant role in Jesus' story. They also help to serve um, by helping us understand the time period that our text is speaking of. So back to the preaching messenger Matthew states that in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. John does not preach in cities or towns or in Jerusalem where we would probably expect to find him. Rather, he preaches out in the wilderness. And this is so reminiscent of the prophets of the Old Testament. There has been no prophet of God 
for over 400 years when John comes on the scene. And now he's arrived and he's out in the wilderness declaring the word of the Lord. Just like the prophets of old who spoke to the people, calling them to dependence on God and to worship God alone. But we see what kind of message John was preaching. Verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist's main message was that of repentance. Some people that think that repentance is being sorry for what you did, or confessing your sins, or changing your mind. These are not exactly what repentance is. True repentance is a complete change of heart, a change of mind, a change of action. It's in a sense to be going in a specific direction to stop and to turn completely around 180 degrees and go the opposite direction. It's an internal change that results in an external change. It's more than just feeling sorry or confessing your wrongdoing. John was preaching out in the wilderness for God's people to repent. But he gives his reason. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. A lot of people misunderstand what the kingdom of heaven is. What does it mean? Well, basically, the kingdom of heaven um, should not be misunderstood as heaven itself. Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, where other gospel accounts use the phrase kingdom of God. So we can understand the kingdom of heaven to be synonymous with the kingdom of God, and we can best understand this kingdom, which is a theme in Matthew, as a kingdom that is from God. A kingdom that is from God is a kingdom that is sourced in heaven. We also need to understand that this kingdom is not simply a spiritual kingdom. Because it does include earthly dimensions and a physical rule at some point. We see this all over prophecy in the Old Testament. The kingdom of God will include a physical reign on earth. So if, if it is a kingdom that is from God... And we know that the physical reign on earth by Jesus has not fully taken place. How can we understand the kingdom of heaven that John spoke of? Well, I think one way to understand this kingdom of heaven is as an already but not yet kingdom. That is, the kingdom of heaven was inaugurated at the arrival of Jesus and it will be consummated at the second return of Jesus. I believe that John and his followers expected the full kingdom, everything, the complete kingdom, but they did not yet know of Jesus' second coming, which is not mentioned until Matthew chapter 9. Because of the kingdom promised in the Old Testament, we can understand that this people logically would have expected the freedom and the blessings that they had longed for as a nation for over 500 years. So back to this preaching messenger. We see that he states the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand. This simply means it's imminent. It's on the doorstep. It is arriving at any moment. John preached with urgency. Repent. The time is now. By the way, Jesus takes up the same sermon of John in his earthly ministry later on. We'll see this in our next chapter in Matthew. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message of repentance is the same message, by the way, of the Old Testament prophets. And it really speaks of the same urgent opportunity preached to God's people back then. Repent, the time is now. So we see John the Baptist is a preaching messenger. Second, he's a promised messenger. A promised messenger. Verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This reference is one of many Old Testament fulfillment passages in Matthew. It's really important for a Jewish audience. Very important for a Jewish audience. Uh, Matthew is written 
to a Jewish audience. They needed to understand that the very person preparing the way for Jesus was also the person that Isaiah spoke of, fulfilling a precious and very distinct promise from their own scripture. The fact that John is confirmed as fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy further vindicates Jesus' identity as the Messiah. So to put it simply, if John is authentic, the one authentically spoken of by Isaiah, then whoever comes after John will be the authentic Messiah. In the Gospel of of John, an amazing discussion takes place between John the Baptist and some priests and Levites who were sent by the Pharisees. They question him. They were trying to figure out who he was and and why he was speaking to God's people. Listen to this exchange in John chapter 1. So they said to him, to, to John the Baptist, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So John the Baptist actually makes this claim about himself. He understood fully that he was the one spoken of by Isaiah. And he knew that his purpose was to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. So he was a promised messenger. This begs the question, how did he prepare the way of the Lord? The answer is his preaching of repentance. Repentance has always been at the center of God's message to his people. Turn around. Turn around from your own way and turn to God. The fact that John preaches this message and the fact that he's baptizing people, which we'll see in a second, is actually very significant in light of the imminence of the kingdom of God. God desires hearts turned completely to him. John was chosen long ago to fulfill the unique purpose of making a people ready for the Lord. He was a promised messenger. Third, he was a unique messenger. He was a unique messenger. Verse 4, now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. A garment of camel's hair. I feel the need to say this. John's camel hair clothes were not the same kind of expensive camel hair clothes that you would see today. Um, For those of you who are super into shopping, Neiman Marcus has on sale right now, today, I'm serious. A camel hair coat that's over 50% off. And it's $1,400. It's originally $3,000. And that's the very low end of their camel hair coats. So, place your order. (laughs) Uh, John's camel hair clothing was nothing like that. Imagine a homeless guy out in the desert eating bugs, sweaty, stinky, matted, full of B.O. and preaching the truth. That's our guy. John was not making a fashion statement, but he was making a statement. He was disregarding everything in this world that mattered to people. When the religious elites of the day were obsessed with their popularity... How they could win favor among the people as being super spiritual and as a result be treated above all the rest. John actually stands in opposition to all of that with everything he does. He lives like a wild man. And he cares about one thing. Getting ready for the arrival of the Messiah. John actually is reminiscent of another prophet, Elijah. 2 Kings 1 verse 8 says that Elijah wore a garment of hair and a leather belt around his waist too. And he lived often in the wilderness proclaiming the word of God to his people. John the Baptist is cut from that same cloth. So it's no surprise that when the angel appears to Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, and and he says these words about John. 
And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Do you see the turn, turn, turn? John the Baptist was instrumental by God in turning people away from their old ways to the Lord. Repentance. He also had a strange diet. He ate locusts and wild honey. And this might not seem very significant to us, but it's actually really important that Matthew includes this detail. He states that John ate locusts. And, and that fact is in line with God's rules for his people in Leviticus. Leviticus 11. Of them you may eat the locust of any kind, the bald locust of any kind, the cricket of any kind, and the grasshopper of any kind, but all other winged insects that have four feet are detestable to you. John's diet was in line with God's rules and did not make him unclean. Although I don't think he was a very clean guy. But ceremonially, he was not made unclean. If John had eaten other things in the wilderness that were considered unclean, then his message and his ministry would have been diminished because he would have been considered unclean and in violation of God's law. He was a unique messenger. And lastly, he was an effective messenger. He was an effective messenger. Verse 5. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This is the first prophet to God's people in 400 years. And so his, his fame grew, and Scripture says that everyone was going out to see him. He was an effective messenger, not because of his popularity. He was an effective messenger because of God's power upon him. People from all over were being baptized and were confessing their sins. And this brings us to a great question. Why is he baptizing? Why is he baptizing? Was this the same kind of baptism that we do in church today? Well, you might be surprised to find out that baptism, water baptism, was actually around for a long time before John the Baptist. Baptism for the Jews before this point was only conducted by religious leaders to bring a Gentile into the Jewish faith and culture. So when, when an outsider wanted to be considered a Jew, wanted to become a Jew, uh, they wanted to convert. They had to be ceremonially washed through baptism. And that was how baptism functioned in Jewish society. Converting away from um, being a Gentile. Renouncing a former way of life. It was to show that they had abandoned their old life and they were now one of the Jews, God's chosen people. So that's how baptism was utilized up until John the Baptist. But what's amazing is that Jews were coming out to John and being baptized. A practice that was only done to convert Gentiles to becoming a Jew. It's significant because this now was not being done as a conversion to Judaism, but as a renouncement of their former way of life. To state that their former way of life was not in line with God. It, th this was connected with the message that John was preaching. Repentance. Repentance. And the sign of their repentance, the symbol of their repentance, was, was water baptism. To show outwardly, what had taken place inwardly. As the people listened to John, they realized that they were not ready for God's kingdom, that they were living for themselves, 
They confessed their sins, they repented, and then they were baptized. So this was attached to repentance in order to be ready for the kingdom of God. This is not to be confused um, into um, a sort of action that accomplished salvation. This was, this baptism did not save them. This baptism was a sign of something that had taken place in their heart already. So this shows us that John the the Baptist's mission to prepare a way for, for the Lord to make ready a people prepared, was highly effective. So this is the messenger of God. He was preaching. He was a promised messenger. He was unique, and he was effective. Let's briefly look at the next portion of the text, verses 7 through 12. The messenger's response to religious leaders. The messenger's response to religious leaders. John, at this point, has gained so much attention that the religious leaders begin coming out to him. We know from John chapter 1 that the religious leaders started by sending priests and Levites. But after a while, they were prompted to come see for themselves, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. John's interaction with them is very significant. Let's look first at his address in verse 7, his address. It says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Brood of vipers, what a statement. Jesus himself uses this same statement later on in in two occasions, Matthew 12 and Matthew 23. We'll see those in our series. It carries with it the idea of being detestable. Of of being an offspring of the serpent from Genesis 3. It's reminiscent of the wicked and the cunning men in the first verses of Psalm 140. And all the negative connotations that we find in Proverbs. John asks a question, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He knew they were not there to repent. They were not there to repent. He knew they had ulterior motives. They perhaps were jealous of his fame. Everyone was going out to see him. His address is significant because he sets up what he's about to state regarding true repentance. Now this next is his instruction. It's his instruction. Verse 8. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. John knew the religious leaders were not sincere. So he points specifically to genuine repentance. True repentance bears fruit. That is, it produces results. John knew that the insincere and the suspicious religious leaders were not there to repent and turn to God. They were not there to be ready for the Messiah. But if they did truly repent, they would need to have the kind of genuine repentance that produces very real results. But he goes further. He answers their objections. And he does so by pointing to their lineage. The religious leaders were not interested in repenting because they relied on the fact that they were descendants of Abraham as the qualifying factor for being ready to experience the blessings of this kingdom that was coming. John essentially says, your lineage means nothing for God's kingdom. God can take these rocks and make them children of Abraham. No one's going to be saved by their lineage. Their lineage is not a qualifying factor 
for receiving God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, he's concerned with those who exhibit genuine repentance. So John gives instruction. Instruction regarding the importance of genuine repentance. Next, notice his illustration in verse 10. His illustration. He says, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John illustrates the importance of genuine repentance. And in the context, the illustration shows us how vital repentance is for being able to participate in God's kingdom. We need to understand um, the picture he's giving us. He uses the language of a farmer. So a farmer would walk through uh, their orchard and examine the trees in their orchard to see which ones were healthy, which ones were producing good fruit. The ones that produced bad fruit were detrimental to the orchard. Why? Well, because they were sucking up all of the nutrients that the trees producing good fruit need. So the farmer would cut down the bad trees, and they became firewood, essentially. As John gives this illustration, he's showing how crucial repentance is. As he spoke these words to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it was a message that was also important for anyone else who was listening. Only those who bear the fruit of true repentance will be a part of the coming kingdom. Notice, lastly, his prophetic preparation. His prophetic preparation. He says in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. These final words of John in our text take on a prophetic foretelling nature. John makes a wonderful comparison with his work and the work of the Messiah who was to come. And notice that he doesn't really downplay his own ministry. He just simply states what his ministry is for. His ministry of baptizing. John's ministry is all about the people changing their direction, a change of, of mind, a change of heart, a confession of sin, it was all about repentance. Why? So that the people would be ready for the Messiah. And he states what his ministry is for, but then John makes the comparison. Rather than downplaying his own ministry, he simply needs to reveal the magnificence of the one who was to come. He says, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. Servants in those days would be responsible for taking care of their master's shoes. They would untie their sandals. They would wash their feet from all the muck and the grime that collected on the dirt roads. And they would carry their, their sandals. John says he's not even worthy to carry the sandals of the one who is to come. He's not worthy to be a servant of the coming Messiah. What a great statement. By the way, John's not being overly humble. He just understands how incredibly significant and magnificent the one who's coming is. Because at this time, he has a right understanding of the Messiah. He understands he's not even worthy to be a servant of him. Notice what he states in his comparison. He says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is the proof of just how much mightier the Messiah who's coming is than John. John can only baptize with water. 
But the Messiah would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Holy Spirit baptism first took place at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit baptized believers. And it happens to every single believer since that time. Because as a person is born again, they are literally baptized, they are covered by the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual baptism. And if you've been born again, then at the moment of your salvation, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit, spiritually. But back at Pentecost, at the very first baptism of the Holy Spirit, there were amazing signs and wonders that were proof that this is the power of the Holy Spirit. And he had come. But John also says that the Messiah will baptize with fire. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, this fire baptism is actually not something that took place at Pentecost. Yes, they did have what looked like tongues of fire above their heads. But this was not a baptism of fire. We know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that every believer has experienced since Pentecost, yet I've never seen a tongue of fire above any of you. What this actually refers to is a final baptism for those who have rejected the one who is to come. It refers to judgment. Because baptism of water and baptism of the Holy Spirit are both immersive. The baptism of fire will also be immersive. God is referred to as a consuming fire. And this consuming fire is not something that Scripture indicates that we're to be excited about. Instead, it should be cause for dread and fear. This goes hand in hand with the illustration that John just gave about the trees. Those who do not believe and show the fruit of true repentance will be like the trees who became firewood. So the Messiah will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And finally, he gives another prophetic foretelling in verse 12. His winnowing fork is in his hand. The one who holds the axe to the trees and casts the bad ones into the fire is the same one who holds the winnowing fork. Here's more language of a farmer, but this time it's a farmer at wheat harvest at wheat harvest. John says he will clear his threshing floor. The threshing floor is where the grain would be separated from the, the husks or the chaff. So because grain is heavier, a farmer would toss the wheat into the air over and over and over again, and when he tossed the wheat, the grain would drop, and the husks, or the chaff, or, which were basically weightless, would be blown away by the wind or easily set aside. John states that the one who is to come will burn the chaff, or the husks, with unquenchable fire. This mirrors his earlier illustration. And John's making a consistent point. Repent! Repent! Those who do repent will be gathered into the barn. They will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. Those who do not repent will experience judgment. That's the message. And the message is urgent. God's kingdom is near. It's at hand. Already the one who is coming is making preparations. So we can sit back and we can understand that this account that we've just seen here in Matthew chapter 3 is extremely important. John is declaring loudly that the people must turn away from their sin and turn to God. Reminiscent of the prophets of old, this new prophet is sharing the same message, repent. And his ministry was marked by baptism. An outward picture of the internal reality taking place among those who were turning to God. Not everyone repented. Not everyone repented. There were perhaps some who, who got baptized but were not genuinely repentant. We don't know. It doesn't say. And that's fine. 
What matters here that we understand is that this is the message the people needed to hear to prepare them to accept Jesus. It was exactly what God wanted them to hear, exactly what they needed to hear. If they would turn completely to God, if they would turn to Him away from their sin, if they would understand that the kingdom of God was at hand, that the Messiah was here, if they would, with repentant, believing hearts, see the power of Jesus on display in his ministry and turn to him in faith, they would be welcomed into the kingdom. It's the perfect setup. Why? Because the people had got so busy with tradition and so distracted by their own fleshly desires. They weren't living for God. They were not ready. And so God sends a messenger to prepare a way to help them be ready for this Messiah who would come. As we close this morning, I just want to share a set of, of implications in about a minute. I'll be very quick here. First, we must understand that without faith and repentance, no one will see the kingdom of God. That's the reality for us today. Jesus already came, but Jesus himself preached the same message. We'll see it in chapter 4. Repent. So let me ask you a question. Have you repented and turned to Jesus by faith? It's the only way to God. Baptism itself is not repentance, by the way. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality. In the same way that John performed it among the people. That's why we value baptism so much here. It's the outward sign of obedience that you give to show others, to declare what God has accomplished within you spiritually. So a simple question I need to ask is this. Have you taken that step? If you're born again, have you been baptized to outwardly illustrate what God's done in you? Have you taken that step to show that your heart is repentant before God? The last implication I want to mention is that God values the fruit of repentance. God values the fruit of repentance. Beyond your initial repentance at salvation... Have you stopped producing good fruit? Have you stopped producing the fruit of a changed life? Have you gone back to your old ways? God values repentance. He demands it. If you are unwilling to surrender some aspect of your life to Jesus... You're producing bad fruit. Will you finally give that up and repent today? Repentance is central to your identity in Christ. Are you walking in it? If not, then right now, in your seat, in your heart, run to Jesus. Throw away that sin at his feet confessing it before him and turn away from that sin permanently. He's waiting on you. Let's pray. God, thank you for what we've seen in this passage today. So many great things that, that we could have pulled out from this text. Lord, we see your great sovereignty here. We see your grace here, we see uh, you providing chance after chance. It shows your heart. Lord, today this message in our context is an opportunity for us to understand that repentance is required. 
Lord, I pray that you would help those here today who are unrepentant to turn to you completely. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would reach the hearts in this room and in the other room or who listen to this online or who watch this on video, that you would reach their hearts, that you would open their eyes. Those who don't know you, that you would turn their heart to you. Thank you for this text working us this week. We pray in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Let's stand together. I again want to express my appreciation to uh, those of you who are in the overflow uh, room making um, opportunities for others to be in here, so thank you for that. Uh, it's a joy for us to welcome visitor, or visitors become members.